Hello everyone, I extend my warm welcome to the participant of fourth day of one week long ongoing Indo-Canada Spark student research conclave on RF energy harvesting system SRC 2020 organized by NIT Silcher, DTU Delhi and Queen's University Canada and hosted by Electronics and Communication Engineering Department NIT Silcher. It is my privilege to welcome the first invited speaker of today's session, Mr. Dasri Surendra, PhD scholar from National Institute of Technology, Silchar. Dasri Surendra received his B.Tech degree in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, Hyderabad in 2008 and a Master of Engineering degree in Microwave and Radar Engineering from Osmania University, Telangana in 2011. Currently, he is working as a full-time PhD research scholar at National Institute of Technology, Silsar. His current research interest includes planar antennas, dielectric resonator antennas, and energy harvesting systems. He has published one journal and four conference papers. With this, I welcome and invite Mr. Surendra Dasri to start the session. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, is it visible, sir? Uh, yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, sir. Go ahead. Make it full screen. Yes, now it is fine. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Myself, Dasar Surinder, a research scholar in the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, National Institute of Technology, Central. First of all, I would like to thank the convener SRC 2020, Dr. Tamur Kansar, for organizing an amazing workshop and inviting me for presenting a talk on design of an efficient RF energy harvester for different applications. Though contents of this talk are need for uh, energy harvesting and its need. First of all, we will discuss about this. And next followed by ref, uh, radio frequency energy harvesting system and its significance will be discussed. Next, the uh, rectana, basically a harvesting system and its function, functional box are discussed followed by the various issues that, are, that a researcher could face will be discussed and the applications of rectana. In this section, we will discuss about different applications of rectana system where we are using and conclusion references. So first of all, uh, uh, what is an energy? The word energy derived from the ancient Greek word energia we know that the energy is the quantitative property that must be transferred to an object in order to perform work on that particular object or to heat that object from the law of conservation of energy we know that the energy cannot be created and destroyed and the law of conservation of uh, cannot be destroyed and it is converted into another form one form to another form the common forms of Energy includes kinetic energy of a moving object and the potential energy stored by an object position in 
force field. So, uh, let us come to our topic energy harvesting. Energy harvesting is a process of utilizing ambient energy for energizing low power electronic devices. By the energy harvesting approach, one form of energy is transformed into another form of energy by a suitable energy harvesting device. So, uh, the need of energy harvesting, as already discussed by the experts, uh, by the energy harvesting approaches, we can utilize the freely available energy and which can extend the lifetime of the battery, uh, which that results the thus, uh, which results the dependence on conventional batteries becomes reduced and which saves the maintenance cost of the device and uh, enhances the system performance also and also reduces the environmental pollution. And some of the alternative energy sources are presented in the slide. Uh, they are thermal source, wind, solar, nuclear, biomass and radio frequency energy sources. Each one has its own merits and demerits. And the performance comparison of a few ambient energy sources such as solar, thermal, piezoelectric and RF energies are presented in the slide. It can be in a tabular form. So it can be observed that the solar power in the ambient environment Solar power in the, uh, solar energy in the ambient en environment is more in density compared to all other energy uh, energies. However, the availability of solar energy is not continuous because it is available during day hours, uh, around six to ten hours. And the disadvantage with the uh, another disadvantage with the solar energy harvesting approach is it requires and it needs a larger area for installing solar, solar panels. And the next uh, thermal energy harvesting is in that the power density of a thermal and the, the power density of thermal energy is also more compared to refined piezoelectric energies, but it is available only when the temperature difference is high. It suffers from larger area and low output power. And the piezoelectric <coughs> energy Density is low in the ambient environment and it is moment dependent. Hence, its availability is not continuous and the power conversion efficiency is, uh, is uh, uh, reduces, is low because if it is continuous then the, the performance is good and the rectifier output becomes more. But it is not continuous so the power conversion efficiency is low and it is a lightweight. That is one of the advantage of this piezoelectric energy harvesting approach. And, and next, the RF energy. The density of the the density of energy in the ambient environment is low. However, the availability is continuous, and it is increasing day to day with an establishment of several several RF transmitters in the ambient environment, such as radio, uh, such as DV uh, digital TV transmitter, mobile towers, Wi-Fi routers, etc. Due to its continuous availability, the power conversion efficiency is more compared to all other energy harvesting approaches. But the received power is depends on the separation between transmitter and receiver. Besides this, the RF energy harvesting system is compact and it is integrated with the NA device. The radio frequency energy harvesting technique attracted over all other energy harvesting because of its easy of installation and compact in dimension and increasing availability due to establishment of more number of transmitter, radio transmitters and it is continuous availability and the power at the rectenna terminal can be controlled by using dedicated transmitting source. It can also be suitable for longer distances. The power conversion efficiency is more and especially this RF energy harvesting is suitable in indoor environment. It can be operated both in indoor and as well as outdoor environments. So that is the um, one of the best advantage of RF energy harvesting system. Various RF power sources uh, uh, are, are presented. Here the intentional is simply a dedicated source. Especially, this is established for RF energy 
energy harvesting applications. Here, uh, for a dedicated source, the uh, signal strength is 4. And for anticipated sources, the signal strength is, is moderate, little bit uh, less compared to the intentional device, uh, dedicated devices. And uh, the ambient environment comprises several unknown sources, comprises uh, several unknown sources. And the power density of the available unknown sources is very low in density. Next, radio frequency energy harvesting is one of the most common techniques used for uh, harvesting electromagnetic energy, especially to energize low power electronic devices. It is a process of capturing electromagnetic uh, energy from the surrounding atmosphere and convert that into electrical disk. The device that is used for RF energy harvesting approach is a rectifying antenna, simply we call it a rectenna. The rectenna comprises of antenna, RF input filter, uh, uh, RF input filter usually a band post filter, uh, impedance matching network, a rectifying circuit and a storage element. For the first time, the rectenna concept was initially proposed for wireless power transmission by an US electrical engineer William C. Brown in 1960s. At that time, Brown, a pioneer of microwave power transmission, was faced with a challenge of how efficiently to receive and convert the received microwave beam into a DC power. And the rectenna was invented in 1964 and patented in uh, 1969 by Brown. And he was demonstrated uh, a model helicopter powered by a microwave transmitter. Um, uh, demonstrated a rectenna with a model helicopter powered by a microwave transmitted beam from the ground uh, the, at an altitude of 30 feet from the lung. Next, uh, performance of the rectenna uh, primarily depends on the receiving ability of the antenna and the power conversion efficiency of the rectifier circuit. The antenna, uh, the uh, power receiving capability, ability of the antenna, the harvesting power of the antenna is usually increased by a high gain antenna or a multi band, uh, multi band or broadband characteristics and a circular polarization characteristics. Since a high gain antenna, since a gain of the antenna is directly proportional to the aperture area of the antenna, that is, a high gain antenna can be received more energy from the ambient environment. A multi r broadband antenna helps in increasing the harvesting power from multiple sources available in the ambient environment, hence the resultant uh, received power at the input of the rectenna is large. And uh, the problem, uh, the misalignment issues uh, present between transmitter and receiver are overcome by a circularly polarized antenna, hence with a proper alignment uh, between transmitter and receiver, the harvesting power can be increased at the receiving end. And the desired properties of the antenna are omnidirectional or directional characteristics. So for uh, this is an, one of the important characteristics of the uh, rectenna. So for wireless power transmission applications, the antenna must have directional characteristics. And when we go for RF energy harvesting, the antenna should have omnidirectional characteristics since the uh, since the ambient uh, since uh, the exact location of the ambient sources uh, it is no, uh, unknown position is unknown in the ambient environment so before designing the rectenna it is most important to design the antenna uh, so in order to capture electromagnetic energy from all directions the antenna must have omnidirectional characteristics that is suitable for RF energy harvesting and when it is intended for wireless power transmission applications, it should have directional properties. And the next is a suitable frequency. A frequency before designing any rectenna, it is most important to design the antenna at a suitable available frequency in the surrounding environment. And uh, finally, the compact dimension of the antenna. 
which is used to explore the applications of vector 9 to many fields. So various band of frequencies that are suitable for RF energy harvesting are presented in the tabular form. Next one is uh, the performance of rectifier performance enhancement uh, performance characteristics. The performance of a rectifier is usually realized by a by the conversion power conversion efficiency of the rectifier and the output voltage uh, delivered from the rectana. So here the power conversion efficiency uh, efficiency of the rectana can be increased by choosing an appropriate diode and by choosing a suitable rectifier configuration for the rectifying uh, for the conversion process and uh, the uh, output voltage from the rectana can be increased by increasing the input power to the rectifier and and the increase uh, the better uh, the rectifier when the rectifier offers large power conversion efficiency so selection of a diode selection of a diode so that is a diode. A diode have, is a, a rectifier is, is the primary component in the rectana system. So choosing a diode is one of the important characteristic parameter uh, uh, in the rectana design. So before designing a rectana, so we have to go for a particular diode. So the diode having low turn on voltage and low series resistance, low junction capacitance and large breakdown voltage are desired. Since a diode with low turn on voltage satisfies bias, biasing condition at low input power levels and the ohmic losses associated with the diode are low when uh, series resistance is low and the diode is suitable at very high frequencies when the junction capacitance offered by a diode is low and the output voltage of the rectifier is limited by a diode breakdown voltage. The maximum voltage offered by a diode is limited to half of the breakdown voltage. So breakdown voltage. And it is difficult to realize both the characteristics that is low turn on voltage and large breakdown voltage in the same diode is difficult. So in such case, we have to choose that for low input power levels, we have to go with the diode with low turn on voltage. So, and for large input power levels, uh, we have to uh, choose a diode with large breakdown voltage. Since a, a, uh, a diode with low turn on voltage has low breakdown voltage. So, a Schottky diode is uh, is found as suitable for rectification in RF energy harvesting purposes because of Schottky diode offers low threshold voltage, low junction capacitance, and moreover, its fast recovery, uh, reverse recovery time because of the absence of space charge region. So, various parameters of the different Schottky diodes are presented in the table, tabular form. So, uh, by comparing the parameters of various diodes, so it is observed that uh, among all diodes, SMS7630 diode offers low turn on voltage. So it is suitable for very low input power levels around minus 40 dBm to 5 dBm. And the breakdown voltage uh, and the breakdown voltage is very less, is 2.0 volts. And the breakdown voltage of the HSMS2820 diode is more, that is 15 volts. So this is suitable for large input power levels um, above 5 dBm. And then next uh, different commonly used rectifier topologies for RF energy harvesting are presented in the figure. So here AB shows a single diode uh, rectifier topology and in figure 4C it is a full wave bridge uh, topology and D shows a voltage doubler rectifier topology and E is a miniature rectifier circuit. So here 
uh, in the rectifier circuit as the number of diodes in the rectifier circuit increases the losses associated associated with the uh, rectifier increases so a, diode, uh, a rectifier with minimum number of diodes has low losses so in this uh, so in this uh, single diode rectifier circuit of a slow power consumption because of this single diode configuration but the uh, the power handling capability of this rectifier is low compared to all other uh, rectifier topologies and the power handling capability of the rectifier is increased with full wave uh, full wave rectifier configurations that is full wave bridge wave, bridge rectifier voltage doubler rectifier and green hr rectifier circuits rectifier circuits so uh, a summary on these rectifier topologies a of a rectifier is suitable at low power uh, it offers low power consumption and it of uh, uh, it is suffering from low power handling capability and the uh, full wave bridge rectifier operates with four diodes configuration it has large power handling capability and large power consumption because of um, uh, increasing number of diodes and a voltage doubler rectifier circuit uses two diodes for its operation so and the output offered by the voltage doubler rectifier is is almost double than that of the uh, of a rectifier circuit and the power handling cap uh, capacity is also more compared to of a rectifier circuit and the final is a green hr rectifier circuit is basically two stage voltage doubler rectifier configuration so the power handling capability is more and it offers more uh, and it uh, suffers from more power consumption and this is a summary a of a rectifier circuit associated with uh, sms7630 diode achieves better results than all possible combinations at low input power levels and a voltage doubler rectifier is most suitable uh, configuration for low and as well as for mid range of rf input power levels the impedance matching network a matching network a network is used to transport maximum power from the antenna to the rectifying circuit the effect of the matching network on to the rectifier output is presented in figure 5 it can be seen that it can be seen that here without matching network when uh, the solid line shows uh, without matching network and this is with matching network this is this shows without matching network this uh, solid line and this solid line and this shows uh, with matching network so by comparison and these are the simulated performance results this uh, solid line shows the simulated performance results so from this when the input power level is increasing for a particular input power level let us take at 0 dbm so by comparing both the performance simulated performance of with and without matching network here it is observed that when without matching network is introduced between antenna and rectifier the maximum voltage offered by the rectifier is 0.5 volts at 0 dbm input power and the maximum output power output voltage offered by the rectifier when matching network is introduced between antenna and rectifier is almost 1.7 voltage so the effect of uh, matching network is is considerable there is a considerable variation in the performance results uh, with the matching network so and here uh, and the same performance is also observed with the measured results and and the impedance matching is easily uh, and it is easy to achieve with a single band operating frequency and for single band of uh, operating frequency when the 
uh, when it is operated with single band, uh, an L section matching network is found to be suitable. And these are the different matching networks used for multi or broadband case. So, uh, in the first uh, 60A, there is a matching network, uh, single uh, single matching network uh, is used for all the all the signals which are harvested by the antenna so here by that it is uh, a single matching network uh, designing a single matching network for all the uh, frequencies difficult or uh, is suitable at ma it is difficult so in order to achieve better matching between antenna and rectifier for multiple frequencies in case of multiband or broadband so that uh, that is uh, split into several rect uh, rect uh, several rf branches each rf branch comprises of band pass filter rectifier and low pass filter so here the matching network and this is uh, designed with multiple stack of rf branches so each branch allowed a single frequency so it is easy to achieve match uh, impedance matching between antenna and rectifier so and the all powers available at the uh, uh, all output of the all rectifiers are combined using a dc power combiner so with this uh, it is easy to achieve uh, better impedance matching uh, with better performance and the next is uh, this is uh, example for in the 6c it is showing uh, that is a rectifier for quad band so here the each branch is uh, allows only a single frequency so for better imprints matching to achieve better imprints matching and better results uh, it is split that entire uh, band pass filter into into stack up several RF branches. And here the same process has been applied uh, for 6D and 6E. Here uh, by increasing uh, as the number of uh, RF input power, uh, power signals are more, then the circuit dimension increases and complexity also increases. So in order to reduce that, here the each branch so the same process has been applied but here the in each arc branch comprises of dual band impedance matching network and a rectifying circuit dual band matching network and which allows two frequencies through a single rf branch so by this the uh, total dimension of the uh, rectifier is compressed so the various different uh, various prince matching uh, network topologies has been compared uh, uh, summary and various uh, topologies is presented in the tabular form it is shows that for a single frequency band l section impedance matching network is suitable and for quad band or, or for multi band case so it is better to go with a stack of multiple uh, matching networks stack of RF branches, rectanos. So, and summary on different IMN topologies, it is summarized that a multiband matching network is suitable. So, what we have discussed so in this year, in 6D and 6E, as the number of uh, RF input power levels increases, the total circuit components increases, especially in the components used in each RF branch increases so the overall mm, the total number of components used in the overall rectifier circuit becomes more so the component losses also be involved in that so because of that so it is better to it is that a multi band matching network is suitable at multi band frequencies than multiple single band impedance matching networks and a stack of several rectana circuits concept is the most adapted impedance matching network technique. So, 
next one is the various design challenges of a rectana so in this first of all the design challenges so first we should identify which frequency is uh, which more appropriate for rf energy harvesting applications so and the next is and we have to harvest all the multiple signals by a single antenna so to increase the harvesting power and uh, which results increase the dc output from the rect uh, rectana circuit and designing a suitable and uh, for a single band case it is easy to achieve impedance matching for a multi band case with the compact dimension of the rectifier it is desired so designing a suitable rectifier with compact dimension is needed and designing an antenna which is operating over broadband frequencies and it is and it is designed to design a highly sensitive rectifier and rectana to harvest broad range of frequencies and uh, and most of the cases and for when we come to implementation point of view so most of the uh, works reported to date have not been uh, pres uh, applied to any uh, applied to the applications so it is important to embed an rf energy harvesting in an appropriate structure whether it may be a roof wall or implants and uh, analyze the effects of multi tone excitation on the ds dc output and sensitivity of the rectifier and uh, designing a compact antenna with high gain usually uh, as the dimension increases the gain is increased so so designing a compact antenna with high gain is designed to reduce the overall dimension of the rectana system and uh, obtaining more dc output from a compact as the input power from the antenna is as the power received by the antenna is less then that affects on overall output performance of the rectana system so designing a compact rectana system with more dc output is is a challenging and uh, and and uh, most of the works reported are tested in the uh, uh, that is anechoic chamber So only few uh, works reported today are tested in the ambient environment. So there is a need to test in the ambient environment, and the various applications of rectana are wireless power transmission and wireless energy harvesting. So and wireless power transmission involves solar power transmission, wireless sensor network, implantable devices. the concept of wireless power transmission was begun in the 19th century from the discovery of michael faraday uh, uh, electromagnetic induction and thus and then followed by tesla's tesla ideas and demonstration using radio waves and radio waves and it is extended to larger distances by the works of tesla using radio waves so the various modes of wireless power transmission are initially wireless power transmission was done using near field approach so there are uh, various approaches of wireless power transmission are near field approach and far field transmission approach in the near field uh, approach there are two ways uh, inductive approach and induct inductive harvesting and capacitive harvesting in the near field inductive transmission to resonant coils placed here each other and in the near field capacitive transmission two parallel conducting plates are placed near each other and whereas in far field power transmission if we, uh, and in the the drawback in the near field inductive transmission is here uh, the misalignment issues sensitivity issues that are occurred and the two coils or two plates must be resonant so these type of issues are solved uh, are minimized by using a far field approach of wireless power transmission in the far field approach antennas plays a significant role in the wireless power transmission 
uh, in the wireless power transmission process the rectum are used to produce the desired form of energy by collecting the microwave energy transmitted by the transmitting antenna so various approaches to various approaches to increase the rectum performance is shown is presented so here uh, strassner uh, strassner and chang have presented have presented three works so one is a single rectana system that is shown in figure 8 single rectana comprises of single uh, antenna and a rectifier single rectifying circuit and in figure 9 he, uh, they were designed a rectana system with array of antenna elements for receiving purpose and, and a single diode for the rectifier configuration and in figure c they have uh, implemented a rectana with array of rectanas and each rectana comprises of array of antenna elements and single diode for recti uh, conversion process so here it is observed that by taking uh, the first one so here it is by considering a single element the output voltage the, the the gain of the antenna offered by a single rectana element is maximum around 8, 8 dB. But by considering array of antenna elements in the second design, so the gain of the antenna is, is almost reached to 14 dB. So from this we can say that the by using array of antenna elements, the gain of the antenna is increased. So the by increasing the uh, and here in the uh, C and in figure C uh, 10, so it can be shown that uh, it can be seen that by uh, by considering array of rectanas, each rectana compresses array of antenna elements. In that by increasing the antenna elements in further, the gain of the antenna uh, is increased further. So, as the number of uh, antenna elements increases, then the gain of the antenna increased. But there is some. But here, and we can also compare the axial ratio performance of three works. So, first one is um, where D shows uh, D is the space between a reflecting, uh, there is a, uh, they were used. A reflecting surface behind an antenna for increasing the gain and by changing the reflecting plane the axial ratio performance is was changed and here the axial ratio performance was not disturbed much by uh, incorporating by increasing the number of antenna elements <coughs> from single element to array of antenna elements and by Considering the RF to DC conversion efficiency performance and the output voltage performance, here we can observe that <coughs> as the input power is increasing, as the input power is increasing, then the RF to DC conversion efficiency is increasing and the output voltage is shown with the dotted lines is also increasing. That is, uh, and the maximum uh, RF to DC conversion efficiency offered is almost 80, uh, 80 percentage. And the maximum voltage offered is 4.8 volts. So in this, in the second, by using the second <coughs> work, by using an array of antenna elements, array of antenna elements. So since the gain was increased and because gain was more, and uh, here the power conversion efficiency is incre increasing with the increasing input power density and here uh, DC output voltage in the first case by using a single rectana element here the maximum voltage offered is 4.8 but here the maximum <coughs> output voltage offered is 6 volts so by using by increasing the gain of the antenna uh, from this we can conclude that by increasing the gain of the antenna 
the output power is increased. So that is indirectly as the gain increases, the receiving power by the antenna is increased. So that is directed to the rectifier. As the power received uh, applied to the rectifier is more, then power delivered from the rectifier is also more with a suitable configuration, rectifier configuration. And the same process and here by considering array of rectana elements. So in the third one is array of rectanas. So we have uh, in that we uh, in that they obtain uh, the uh, voltage is almost 16 volts. So it is very large compared to the first and second designs. So from this the array of antenna elements enhances the gain of the antenna uh, and uh, the effect of the array elements is minimum. The array of uh, rectanas increases the overall DC output. And here in this, uh, it is presented uh, another technique for increasing the gain here in this. Um, in this uh, first one is a single feeding technique and the second one is differential feeding technique with two ports uh, by applying 90 degrees of phase difference between two ports. So here as and there is uh, by observing the figure 13c, there is no much effect on resonant frequency of the antenna. Resonant frequency is almost same in two, <coughs> two designs. But when we compare, when we observe the gain of the antennas of these two antennas, the gain of the antenna is more with differential feeding configuration. Differential feeding configuration. So, and the power conversion efficiency and output power is also observed. Uh, can also observe in figure 13D from this, the black line uh, shows that the top one shows that the rectana one that is due to the power uh, efficiency of rectana one that is less compared to the rectana two. Rectana two efficiency is less in a single. Uh, feeding approach. So the output voltage also more in differential feeding approach. And here also the performance of the antenna gain performance is uh, improved performance is observed with dual port feeding. This is some approaches for circular polarization characteristics are presented. Here this is uh, first one is uh, unba uh, unbalanced circular slots. And second one is uh, peripheral cuts by applying. And the next one is symmetrical strips along the diagonal directions. And the next one is uh, truncated corners. And this is uh, the design for compact dimension. Here the sentinel geometry is presented. Here the maximum gain achieved in this is, is uh, maximum 2.2. 2.2 at the resonant frequency is the maximum gain is 2 volts, uh, 2 decibel dBA, 2 dBA. So that is the, when the dimension of the antenna is less, then the gain that affects more on gain or gain performance also. And the rectifier offers low conversion efficiency with low input RF power levels. And these are the performance comparison of various techniques for circular polarization. So in this, the truncated corner approach is, is found as a suitable technique for getting circular polarization. And this is a short notes on wireless power transmission. Next, uh, wireless energy harvesting applications. So in the wireless energy harvesting or uh, radio frequency energy harvesting, the rectana collects ele electromagnetic energy from the ambient sources that are present, uh, which are present in the surrounding atmosphere. So they are unknown sources, uh, which are not dedicated sources, ambient sources present in the surrounding atmosphere. And in that case, to increase the receiving power by the antenna, the antenna should have again or a multiband characteristics or a broadband characteristics for increasing the receiving power as we discussed in the earlier phase. So here the desired properties of the antenna are the antenna must have 
certain polarization characteristics to uh, avoid uh, to overcome the or avoid the misalignment issues present between transmitter and receiver so and omnidirectional characteristics to receive the ambient en uh, energy from any direction so the antenna must have omnidirectional characteristics this is one of the important characteristic parameter for rectenna for wireless energy harvesting applications and the compact dimension means as the gain of the antenna is increased then the applications of the the uh, applications of the rectenna becomes limited so when the dimension of the system is reduced then it is explored into many fields in this uh, some approaches some techniques are presented to increase the gain of the antenna so in this first one is uh, in the figure 17 it is showing a reflecting plane concept so by placing a reflecting plane behind an antenna so the the radiation of the antenna is directed in single direction so the gain of the antenna can be increased by placing a reflecting plate behind an antenna and the next one is by using by a multi layer structure here we observe that so the uh, results of multi layer structure so by observing the gain performance of the multi layer structure it is observed that this is the solid line represents seven layers no air gap and here six layers no air gap this block line shows dotted one is no air gap with six layers and this is no air gap with seven layers so it is observed that the maximum gain of the antenna is achieved with seven layers then six layers uh, gain is achieved with seven layer structure so and here when air gap is introduced this is further increased gain the gain is further increased so it is observed that the number of layers as it is increasing then gain is increased it is observed that a reflecting uh, this is the summary of on these two structures and the next is uh, and in 19 a differential feeding configuration is observed similar performance here this figure 19c shows the uh, efficiency and output uh, dc power performance with respect to the rf input power density so as the power density is increasing then same rectifier efficiency and as well as the output dc power is increasing here here this is the red color solid uh, this one top red color showing that shows that efficiency of differential fed rectenna and this one is efficiency of single fed rectenna now it is observed that the differential feeding approach the differential feeding approach the rectenna offered more efficiency rectifier efficiency because of and the gain offered is also more in a differential feeding approach uh, and here the gain, uh, gain comparison performance is shown in the tabular form the simulated gain uh, in single fed array it is uh, offered is 14.4 to maximum and in differential feed array it is 14.95 and the increase in performance of the uh, antenna can also be observed by placing a perfect electric conducting walls on the edges of the at uh, substrate so this is and here the performance results the black shows no wall when no wall is present on the substrate and red shows that and when perfect electric conducting wall is placed on the substrate here it is shows that along zero along zero at along zero degrees angle uh, the gain is more compared to when no wall is present and the next is the array of antenna elements here it is observed that uh, by observing a single antenna offered low gain and array of antennas offered gain compared to single one and uh, these are 
uh, our techniques are used to increase the gain so uh, generally uh, <coughs> the antenna gain enhancement uh, gain can be increased by either of these techniques and various techniques the performance is compared and the performance results are shown from this a multi layer structure helps in increasing the antenna performance with small antenna dimension compared to all other techniques and with easy of modeling and these are the various miniaturization approaches so the, uh, the increase in antenna dimension increase the overall dimension of the antenna which uh, limits the application so in order to reduce the antenna dimension there are some approaches are proposed by various the first one uh, fractal coach fractal geometry is proposed and in the second one fractal geometry is proposed for for achieving the compactness and this is mindelland structure and this fractal geometry so it is observed a it is hilbert fractal geometry and in 28 tapered oscillating tapered slot is presented and when we can uh, observe uh, the gain pattern <coughs> uh, pattern of all these antennas the performances of uh, individual antenna is presented in tabular form and the results are are shown here from this the gain of the antenna as the, the here the dimension of the antenna is affects on the gain performance from this so from this uh, the Sierpinski fractal geometry provides the better gain performance of the antenna <coughs> with small dimension and for fractal geometry is most adapted technique for achieving compactness next the broadband antennas so in the broadband antenna the antenna can receive multiple uh, uh, that is uh, receive energy from multiple sources present within the band of frequencies so here the various approaches of broadband antenna antenna configuration sir first one is uh, grounded coplanar wave gate technique and then the next one is layering at each bend the bandwidth by um, flaring at each end the bandwidth of the antenna is increased and uh, here the slotted approach in the ground pin using a dr uh, dielectric resonator antenna with slotted ground is also achieved a wide band and uh, fractal antenna uh, that is uh, slotted uh, fractal geometry and the next one is uh, patch loaded in addition to a slot in the ground pin here patch antenna is placed in the ground pin and the top of the substrate and the partial grounding with notch is also used and the next one is uh, rectangular and annular slots these are the various approaches are used for getting the broadband characteristics of the antenna so when the performances are compared and the results are presented in the table <coughs> tabular form it is observed <coughs> a coplanar waveguide feeding approach is is found as suitable for getting broadband characteristics of antenna and the effect of multiband configuration <coughs> here from the figure 29 it can be observed that as the when uh, from the figure it is observed that major one rf source when a single source is considered for So a single RF source is considered. The maximum RF to DC conversion efficiency offered at zero dBm is around sixty, sixty percentage. And uh, when two sources, one more sources is included for the first one, then the efficiency gets increased to seventy. 
and uh, when three sources are considered it is 80% and by further increasing to four sources then the efficiency became 82 percentage now uh, here as the number for the same zero dvm input power level that it means that as the number of uh, rf input power levels increases when the power received by the antenna increases then then the it provides more conversion efficiency uh, and this one is so similarly for a single uh, source case uh, the maximum output voltage of it is 2.6 and by increasing the number of RF sources at the input side, then the output voltage is increased. So it can we can say that the increase in number of input power levels to the rectangle system increase the power conversion efficiency and as well as the output DC power. And some of the multiband antenna configurations represented the slide. So these are the various techniques. So among all. A slotted lo slot loaded geometry provides better results to getting for getting the multiband characteristics and wireless sensor networks. <coughs> so here in this, I have presented an experimental setup of rectana emb embedded in a concrete concrete to monitor the performance of any bridge or a structure. Here the performance is observed by placing the rectana in a buried concrete. So it is in placed in buried concrete and uh, the transmitting antenna is designed with an array of patch elements for radiating purposes and the rectana performance is observed with different media. One is wet concrete and the other one is dry con concrete. So in two different medias it was placed and observed. Uh, and is a, it was also observed by increasing the thickness of the concrete, this one, by increasing the concrete layer. And it is also observed, it was also observed for different distances between transmitting and receiving antennas. And from the experimental results, it is observed that, <coughs> it is observed that uh, when the uh, rectina is placed in dry concrete, and the performance of the rectina is good when it is placed in dry, dry con concrete when compared to the wet concrete. Here it is observed that the voltage of it is 0.65 when it, is play, when it was placed in wet concrete and when it was placed in dry concrete it, the maximum output of it is voltage up, uh, achieved was 1.44 and for thickness value of 20 mm when it is increasing from 20 to 60 mm <coughs> increasing d value then the performance of the output uh, the output voltage offered by the rectana is decreasing and further decreasing when it was placed in wet concrete concrete and it is also observed with d so it is observed that the receiving power by the rectana reduces with increase in concrete cover thickness and the power pow performance of the rectana is found better in dry concrete, dry concrete over wet concrete and the performance is, was also, uh, is also affected by the gap between transmitting and receiving antennas. <coughs> rectana for medical uh, uh, implantable devices. Nowadays, the role of medical implantable devices expanding extensively for the medication of crucial elements like uh, cardiac pathologies, deep brain stimulation device, and electrocardiogram, etc. These health monitoring devices involve an efficient implantable antenna for instantaneous RF power reception and data sharing. And external control uh, helps in collecting important information about medical implants wirelessly, which is desirable for therapeutic and diagnostic applications. 
as for issues associated with the power the energy required to operate several implantable devices is usually provided by a any lithium ion battery is incorporated into a device however uh, the the device the battery suffers from the limited lifetime hence uh, surgery is is needed to replace the battery frequently which uh, which is high risk to the patient health and it is discomfort and so uh, in the beginning a near field approach was intended for medical implants when a couple of inductors placed one on the patient skin and the other one implanted under the tissue <clears throat> so different near field approaches for medical implants are presented in this the first one uh, the first one one of the coil is based in a tissue and the other and the correspond and the other one is one is coil is placed in the tissue and the other one is placed the near by that tissue and the other and the corresponding performance is observed experimentally from that by increasing the spacing so it is observed that when it is same similar kind of performance results are observed uh, when it is placed in air two are placed in air that is the efficiency is 75 percentage with 10 mm spacing when the oops, when the spacing is increasing from 20 mm or uh, 10 mm to 20 mm when they are placed in when they uh, those two are placed in air medium the maximum tra transfer efficiency power transfer efficiency is 20.5 percentage and it is when it is increasing when the space is increasing from 20 mm to 50 mm the power transfer transfer efficiency is further reduced to 0.44 percentage and by uh, when it is placed in tissue one is placed near the tissue and the other one is placed within the tissue in that case the transfer efficiency is further reduced with the increase in spacing so in the second one uh, same uh, two coils one is placed uh, near the skin and the other one is implanted to so the uh, for pacemaker applications so here the near field energy harvesting uh, suffers from low quality factor of the coils misalignment issues highly resonant and it is especially limited to short distance and uh, so these problems in near field are overcome avoided using far field approaching approach so various uh, in that uh, two designs uh, rectangular configurations for uh, in the in for far field case are presented one is a variable rectangular and the other one is implantable device solar power transmission applications and there are various modes of solar power transmission application in the first one is uh, here the rectangle is placed in the ground plane and uh, these are the two modes here microwave wireless power transmission system for terrestrial based transmitter transmitting to a uh, high altitude platforms and in the second one here we are transmitting Uh, these are for solar applications and here a large amount of power can be generated uh, using solar power transmission system but the disadvantage with the solar power transmission system is it requires a large space for installation and uh, resultant installation cost is also increased uh, rectangular performance enhancement techniques there are some enhancement approaches are there Uh, the first one is the in that voltage multipl multiplier configuration has been proposed so in that as the number of stages uh, from the figure 39b it is observed that as the number of stages is increasing first one is first stage 
that is shown with the red color so when the when we uh, connect to a single stage the maximum output voltage offered is for 10 milliwatts power input rf power is almost 1.7 and when two stages are connected in that case it is increased further and by further increasing the number of stages it is reduced to, uh, it is increasing further and the same performance is also observed is also observed here in c and d so this is the summary on multi stage rectifier circuit as the input power level increases the performance of both the rectifier circuit and the rectifier system increases with increasing number of rectifier stages if the but uh, it is limited to certain uh, some number of rectifier stages by further increasing number of uh, rectifier stages the performance gets decreased because the number of components used in the rectifier circuit becomes more so the losses associated with the number of components present in the rectifier becomes more then that uh, shows uh, that results uh, which affects on total rectana performance hence the performance of the uh, efficiency performance reduces resultant output is also reduced by further increasing the number of stages so it is limited to certain number of stages and if the input power is low some amount of the rs harvested power is absorbed by passive components in the circuit thus so that is when the input power is low then it is better to go with the minimum number of rectifier stages and when the input power is large and it is better to go with the um, so um, more number of rectifier stages so this is also one of the technique uh, these are the two techniques for increasing the dc output by the rectana so first one is rf power combining technique and the second one is dc power combining technique already discussed in the rf power combining technique first we harvest the signals from multiple sources this is all the signals are joined by using a rf combining circuit that signal is passed through a single rectifying circuit and in the second case we are uh, harvesting signals from multiple sources multiple sources and each source is uh, each signal is passed to a individual rectifying circuit and the output from the individual rectifier is joined by using a dc combining circuit the here why we go for uh, rf combining circuit and why we go for dc combining circuit when the input power is less it, uh, the minimum power is necessary for biasing to satisfy the biasing condition of a diode so when it is less so in that case we have to uh, rf combining circuit is important so it is take, uh, it receives multiple signals then the resultant input power increase then that satisfies the biasing condition of the rectifier uh, diode uh, biasing condition so that is suitable when power is more then dc combining circuit is more then individual is connected to the individual rectifier and the output is combined through dc combining circuit the resultant output becomes more and here um, rf power combining te uh, technique here we are combining all the signals so the resultant uh, beam bandwidth is uh, beam width is becomes narrow and the dc power combining it is wider so this is these are the compare uh, performance comparison of uh, rf power combining and dc power combining techniques and there are various energy sources for measurement of rf energy there what is ambient source and dedicated source so this is the experimental measurement the first one showing the measurement of rectana in the anechoic chamber and in the second one is the ambient measurement testing so this is the conclusion so so further reduction in the rectana system dimension is needed without degrading the system performance and most of the systems are presented 
tested in the uh, laboratory itself so there is a need to uh, explore into the ambient environment so certain alignment i am and i also thankful to my supervisors professor fazal talabdar sir and dr tamil khan sir for their support thank, thank you, you sir. thank you sir. thank you so much for a comprehensive lecture on rf energy harvesting system this is a limited duration of 60 minutes quickly i am passing on two queries to you first yes, one is <clears throat> what are the different techniques to reduce the size of overall rectenna system yes sir mainly the uh, size of the rectenna uh, is mainly depends on the dimension of the antenna sir as the dimension of the antenna is less then the overall rectenna dimension also becomes less so the various approaches are fractal geometry hilbert transform and mindel line approaches are useful among all fractal geometry is best one sir okay uh, second query is what is the difference between broadband and wideband both are same or have some different meaning broadband and wideband both are same sir broadband and wideband okay yes sir. okay uh, now i must say thank you thank you to sir you thank you for, for inviting me for sir. delivering the lecture invitation was long back okay sir, thank you sir now, thank you for a sir. nice delivery of contents now you <coughs> leave leave the uh, sharing so okay. that is another speaker comes forward thank you sir now for the next lecture of today's session i take the privilege to invite our own phd scholar mr rashitosh srivastav who is doing phd here at nit selchar ashutosh srivastav did his btech in electronics and communication engineering from hindustan institute of technology greater noida in 2012 and mtech in microelectronics and vlsi design from nit mizoram in 2018 presently he is working as a phd scholar in the department of ec at nit selchar uh, with this i request to Mr. Ashutosh Srivastava to start the session. Um, good evening all. My warm greetings to one and all present here. I'm Ashutosh. Uh, so should I start my presentation? Yes. Please share your screen and start. I should to share your screen. Okay, yes. Uh, hello, one and all. Uh, I'm Ashutosh Shrivastava, a PhD scholar in the Department of ECE and Agriculture. Uh, so today, uh, today I'm going to give my talk on the topic energy harvesting through thin film based solar cell systems for various terrestrial and non terrestrial applications. Uh, as far as like uh, so all the lectures, they were more or less concentrated towards the antennas and uh, radio frequency uh, wave collection, but uh, this will be a kind of uh, uh, energy harvesting through Uh, photovoltaic uh, system that is uh, basically a solar cell system uh, in which i'll be concentrating more and more on this thin film based technologies uh, so uh, my presentation outline will goes like uh, first of all i'll be talking about a very brief introduction about why i have uh, what are the present scenario of this non renewable uh, energy resource and then uh, there is this uh, various technologies in the solar cell like uh, how many technologies are uh, currently working and which uh, what are the other possibilities and uh, which of them are uh, presenting well then uh, the basic working of a solar cell because it is very much needed 
to give uh, listeners a brief intro about it so that they can visualize how exactly they work and how exactly the energy is being harvested from it. And then I'll be concentrating on uh, this thin film technology. It's a part of solar cell technology wherein uh, this uh, application part is wide enough and the conversion efficiency is a bit more good as compared to the other parts. And then I'll be uh, showing a bit of my research work, which I am doing right now in my PhD, uh, along with some references. Uh, so uh, let me start with this. Uh, if you all can see this, uh, there is a pie chart showing the word energy consumption. So this left one goes with uh, like, uh, uh, there are four parts which are having this nuclear energy, this coal energy, this oil energy, and the natural uh, gas. Out of them, there is one such energy that is called renewable energy source. So basically renewable energy is nothing but uh, that part of energy source that is present in our uh, atmosphere uh, that, uh, that will not get replenished, means uh, that can be replenished every single time without our concern. And uh, if I talk about uh, this renewable, it counts for around 10.4% of the total world energy consumption. Uh, although this uh, figure is very less, but definitely since it's a renewable part, uh, if it can be more harnessed, then definitely it can be helpful to meet the whole world energy consumption uh, in coming years to come. Uh, if I talk about this renewable energy source, uh, it itself comprises of uh, various other sources. Uh, which can be uh, written over here like uh, wind energy, like uh, uh, wind energy is also a renewable part of energy source uh, along with this geothermal and biomass. Geothermal are the energy that we get from the uh, various movements inside the earth. Then the biomass is basically the energy that we can generate from uh, the fecal material or the uh, biomass that is present all across the earth uh, by its uh, decomposition. Then it comes a hydroelectric uh, which is uh, basically 65% uh, of the total renewable contribution, which we all know that uh, uh, energy consumption uh, is basically met by this hydroelectric power generation in most of the countries, because uh, it is something that uh, we use those turbines and all. And then it comes the solar cell, like not solar cell, but the solar energy. Uh, which comprise of 7.1% of the total renewable part, which itself is a 10.4%. So as we can see that although this uh, solar energy is very less, uh, solar energy's contribution is very less in the total of uh, meeting the world power consumption. But uh, if we keep on, yeah, if we keep on improving our uh, devices to meet this energy harvesting, then definitely it, it will meet uh, the most part of energy consumption of the whole world. Because as we know, out of all these energy, uh, all these renewable energy present, solar energy has the most uh, proportion of its presence in the atmosphere. Uh, if I uh, talk about this hydroelectric, this wind, this geothermal, uh, with this wind part is like, uh, it will be concentrated to a very little part of the earth like uh, it may not be that much compact, compact, uh, competent in uh, rest part of the world if it is comes to the one part but it's solar energy is somewhat like uh, it comes to most part of the world so all we need is to get into some uh, technologies that we can go through so that we can get more energy harvesting through it now uh, since I was talking about the solar energy, uh, to uh, convert the solar energy into our uh, usable energy, we need a device which we all call as a solar cell. Uh, so before moving on to the basics of solar cell, the working of the solar cell and the technologies that are, I'll be talking about here, uh, before that we, we must know certain facts related to the solar cell, uh, which I'll be reading like uh, photovoltaic energy conversion relies on the number of photon strikes on the earth. like. Uh, uh, when we are talking about the energy harvesting, it means that we need to convert that energy that is present in the earth. So that energy reaches earth uh, in the form of photons that we all know, uh, which we can call as the flux of photons in the form of light particles. And uh, talking about the stats, uh, it's a 4.4 raised to the power 6, 17 photons strike the square centimeter of our surface every second. So uh, 
this it's uh, the stats itself is a uh, measurement to understand how uh, big this energy is uh, if we can uh, ever get some technologies that can harness most of its parts into a usable energy uh, as my third line say that only some of these photons those with energy in excess of the band gap uh, there's a new term band gap uh, band gap is basically nothing uh, the difference between the conduction band and the valence band of a semiconductor why i'm talking about the semiconductor because the semiconductor will be the basic material in the device used for uh, solar energy conversion that is the solar cell so that so we must know this uh, basic concept of uh, band gap uh, here it is also written uh, that can be converted into electricity by the solar cell so hello Oh, okay. Now, when such a photon enters the semiconductor, it may be absorbed, promoted, an electron from a valence band to the conduction band. So, uh, this uh, this one line states that how this energy harvesting is done through solar cell. Basically, what happens that the, when such photons enter the semiconductor, that uh, which is a basic part of a solar cell, uh, it uh, it is absorbed by the electron present in the semiconductor to get into some energy, and with that energy, it uh, goes to some other part of uh, solar cell device and that finally uh, gets into uh, current that we need to get at the output end. So this is how it goes. Uh, this photon generated uh, photon generated electron hole pair when transported to the material in the outer circuit it forms a current that I have already said. So this is a very certain fact related to a solar cell which we all need to know. Now how energy is harvested through solar cell? So before that, uh, it's very important to understand uh, what are the various technologies that uh, are present in our uh, current scenario and uh, most importantly, which of them is very uh, competent to meet the power uh, generation. So uh, basically a photovoltaic technology that is a solar cell technology is uh, comprising of three different generations. That is the first, second and third. So uh, the first generation solar cells are basically the bulk uh, or we can say Thick film based means uh, uh, the heart of any solar cell is a semiconductor material. So uh, depending on the width of that material, it is uh, like first generation or second generation. So in basically in first generation, that uh, heart material uh, is basically in a form of a bulk, uh, which is a thick film based. So in that, uh, we, uh, there is a presence of like this crystalline silicon. Uh, means the heart of that absorber material which is there in solar cell is either in crystalline silicon form which could be either a single crystalline or multi crystalline means uh, that absorber material will be uh, form of uh, the single crystalline silicon or it could be a multi crystalline silicon material and that material will be in the form of a bulk uh, then in other case it can be a gallium arsenide single junction means uh, in place of silicon we can also use gallium arsenide as the absorber material of the solar cell and likewise there are also uh, group third and fifth combination elements uh, so that is like indium phosphite and all so uh, those all bulk material absorber material are basically uh, uh, comprising the first generation solar cells now uh, when it comes to second generation solar cell uh, the, uh, the basic uh, quality of this generation second uh, solar cell was that uh, it always comprised of the thin film uh, wafer means earlier when uh, it was silicon or this gallium arsenide they used to be present in form of a bulk means bulk means a very thick material uh, thick uh, layer of the material and uh, the second generation comprises of this thin film based materials so uh, there are uh, four basic and very prominent uh, technologies used uh, present in the second generation they were like this amorphous silicon like earlier we used to have this crystalline silicon which, which was present in a thick film form and it could be an amorphous silicon then it could be an cadmium telluride technology or it could be CIGA that is a copper indium gallium diselenide uh, technology and the last one is the copper zinc tin sulfide uh, which is basically uh, the very prominent uh, absorber material which is present in the second generation and also uh, a technology that is being uh, researched a lot to get into uh, better and better efficiency because of its a uh, lot of uh, importance because of presence of 
these materials which are very much earth abundant and also they are also um, you can say uh, uh, they are not uh, that much uh, problematic or uh, troublesome that as like the previous one like the indium and uh, the cadmium these are very uh, but uh, these materials are not uh, that much good to be used in our earth crust uh, because of their uh, some uh, poisonous behavior but uh, these two uh, elements are not present in this czts technology so uh, in this thin film based technology it is very good technology to be explored and then comes the third generation solar cell uh, it, uh, this generation solar cell is basically categorized not on the basis of either like a thin film or thick film definitely they are using all in the form of thin film but uh, here the material uh, is like very different kind of novel materials like uh, uh, this third generation can be uh, comprised of this dye synthesized solar cells uh, in which uh, we used to have some liquid form of dyes that can be used as an absorber material for the generation of this electron hole pair and finally contributing towards the generation of the current uh, it can also be uh, comprised of organic solar cells uh, wherein the uh, this important uh, absorber material is comprised of any organic material and then uh, nowadays uh, because everything is going uh, in a very diminished uh, form of uh, uh, its presence so it's uh, quantum dot solar cells wherein uh, those uh, all uh, generation and all goes into in the in form of quantum dots and finally it's a perovskite solar cell uh, which is the heart of this third generation solar cells material wherein this uh, efficiency is increasing very much and also um, it is also uh, going like the the various issues that used to be there with the third generation like the uh, there was an issue of uh, uh, the stability of these solar cells so those things have been eradicated in this perovskite solar cells so out of these technologies the thin film technology is very prominent and uh, when we incorporate this thin film technologies with the novel material then that technology is nowadays very much prominent. Uh, so uh, this slide uh, basically shows the efficiency chart. So uh, all uh, like uh, whatever I was talking like these three, four uh, in every generation. Here uh, we have a paragraph showing the efficiency chart of all. So let me uh, go directly to this first generation. We can see. And that the efficiency is 26.1% for silicon, 22.3% for gallium, and likewise, like a uh, single crystal, multi crystal, and then 27.8 for gallium arsenide. Uh, uh, talking about this second generation, uh, this uh, cadmium telluride technology is having 22.1% of uh, power conversion efficiency, and uh, this um, CIG that is copper, indium, gallium, diselenide technology is having 22.9%. And the very prominent and very emerging technology that I was talking was uh, CZTS based solar cell, though it has only nowadays 12.6% of efficiency. But yeah, it is being explored a lot because the uh, efficiency chart of this cadmium telluride and CIGS has gone almost to a stagnation stage. And also the presence of these very um, not good material like the cadmium and indium has uh, made this research to uh, shift towards this CZTS technologies because uh, it has lots and lots of uh, perks as compared to the uh, uh, previous one, two technologies. Uh, moving on to this third generation solar cell, uh, we can see there's uh, all this efficiency. And uh, if I am not wrong, this uh, path, perovskite solar cell that has a power conversion efficiency of 23.7% which is uh, more or less very much similar to the uh, like a silicon based technology because uh, the market based solar cells are uh, nowadays only uh, dominated by the silicon and gallium arsenide which basically the thick film technology is being uh, dominated in the market but now uh, we have achieved this power conversion efficiency of perovskite solar cells to be 23.7 percent so uh, Uh, now moving on to a very basic solar cell working diagram means uh, to a layman also it can be uh, very easily understood that how exactly a solar cell work uh, that's nothing more than these two n type and p type semiconductors 
uh, when we just uh, uh, get these two materials back to back to each other in a layered form uh, they form a junction wherein this light energy falls yeah this light energy falls and it generates this electron hole pair uh, this electron hole pair has to travel this uh, uh, this depletion region area which is uh, acquainted by uh, the presence of uh, uh, the energy between the two and uh, finally it reaches to the final output uh, like uh, output by saying means uh, we can collect that power here so th this is how the energy is being harvested using uh, this uh, n and p type of semiconductor which itself is a pn junction and it's a very basic solar cell so uh, of course we all know that this energy like, like this current will definitely be in the form of a dc so uh, the dc current is converted to 40 volt ac and finally energy can be harvested easily yeah so i uh, uh, when i'm talking about a solar cell working there are three basic steps being followed here so the first step is the absorption of incident photons uh, the absorption of these photons on uh, depends on photon energy and the energy levels of the absorber layer so let me uh, talk about this absorber layer is nothing but the material which is responsible for uh, harvesting of energy means uh, this material itself is the only reason for the creation of this pn junction which will help in uh, getting those electron hole pair and then segregating that electron hole pair to get into the final circuit to collect the power at the output end so uh, uh, in uh, this absorption process occurs in that absorber layer and uh, as i have already told in the very previous slide that uh, uh, the band gap of this absorber material plays a vital role in uh, selection of the absorber material like uh, which technology we are working with and uh, which material we are using in that technology depends on the band gap of material like not, not every material can be used uh, for the energy harvesting of a uh, like solar energy harvesting uh, through that material and the basic criteria has to be is like the band gap of the material should be greater than uh, should be equal to the uh, photon energy like e is equals to h nu is the power present in uh, photon so that uh, energy has to be equal to uh, the band gap energy of the material so if you can see in this figure four uh, i have shown like this uh, this is called uh, like we all know that conduction band and the valence band so this conduction band sorry valence band maxima and this conduction band minima has a separation of energy states like this uh, these this uh, space is forbidden to be having the presence of energy states that's why it is called forbidden energy gap so this energy gap has to be equal to the photon energy like the energy present in the photon that is basically a flux of uh, that sorry uh, that basically a part of the flux of uh, radiation coming from uh, solar radiation so uh, that band gap has to be equals to h nu and if it is that then the electron present in the valence band minima will be absorbing this electron uh, so will be absorbing this energy and getting back to this conduction band uh, from conduction band minima to the valence band maxima and this process is called absorption which is the very first step of uh, uh solar cell app, uh, solar cell working and this process occurs in uh, a uh, absorber material now depending on the material we are using it can be either a direct band gap semiconductor or can be an indirect band gap semiconductor so uh, as we can see from the uh, this uh, diagram four that a states that uh, it can, uh, when the transition between the valence band and conduction band is directly from the minima to the max from maxima to minima like uh, valence band maxima the lower side to the uh, conduction band minima then it is called direct band gap semiconductor and if uh, this transition occurs in between like there there used to be one some other states present in this forbidden energy so uh, this type of transitions are called indirect transitions and the semiconductor material that exhibit such uh, transitions are called indirect semiconductors so depending on the lifetime of the carrier uh, this uh, uh, electron and hole will be propagated to the circuit through the material and finally will be collected at the circuit uh, this figure 5 uh, uh, is like uh, a very uh, typical uh, state uh, showing uh, diagram wherein i am showing 
uh, like this conduction band can be shown as a as a straight line to show the all the presence of uh, conduction band minima to be on this ec level and then all the uh, valence band to be present at the maximum of this ev and these th uh, three or four states that are present between the uh, for uh, recombination between and actually uh, deteriorates the uh, characteristics of a solar cell so the first step is the absorption which occurs in the absorber layer then uh, after absorption absorption sorry uh, there used to be the generation of free electron hole pairs uh, which will be responsible to propagate through the circuit through the device uh, through the material of the device and finally collected at the end so uh, here is a, like the exciton uh, exciton is nothing but uh, when we collectively find an electron hole pair uh, then that collection is called as an exciton and it is bounded by a binding energy which is given by eb is equals to mu e to the power 4 to h cross epsilon square where mu is the uh, mobility of that electron and epsilon is the uh, dielectric constant of that material and uh, this h cross and e is the electronic charge and h cross is a uh, constant so uh, and uh, just after the absorption of that uh, photon that we have uh, not uh, that the solar has solar cell has taken from solar energy uh, this electron hole pair has to be generated uh, and this will be generated because of the absorption of photon this binding energy will be uh, like uh, that uh, that energy of absorption will be more than this binding energy and then now the electron and hole will no no more be binded towards each other and it will be free to move uh, in the device And finally, the third stage and the fourth stage collectively can be called as a transport and collection of carriers. So after the generation of this electron hole pair, this has to be transported to the two end contacts, wherein uh, at the end it will be collected towards the final, uh, uh, final output power taking device. Uh, so, uh, uh, here we can see that the collection efficiency of the photo generated carriers, this photo generated carriers are nothing but the only carriers that are generated because of the absorption of photons and uh, their collection efficiency means how many of them has been generated and out of those generated, how many have been collected depends on the diffusion length of the electron and holes. So uh, what is this diffusion length of electron and holes? There is nothing but diffusion length is basically uh, like when an electron is generated anywhere it has uh, some lifespan like in that lifespan whatever distance is travel it is uh, traveling that distance is called as diffusion length and uh, uh, as we all can visualize that if my width of the material is more than the lifespan diffusion length of an electron then definitely my electron will not travel to the end of the material so this is a very important concept to be taken care of in choosing the material because uh, that diffusion length has to be less than the width of the absorber layer so that my electron and hole pair hole can travel uh, at to the extreme of the material and finally get collected at the end uh, to collect the electron the work function of semiconductor must be higher than the work function of electrode yeah like in a normal uh, structure of a solar cell we do have uh, like uh, this pn junction layers and all and at the end we have uh, we should have one two electrodes that the positive cathode and electron and the anode so to collect the electron at one end the work function of the semiconductor must be higher than the work function of electrode and uh, to collect the holes the work function of electrode must be higher than the work function of semiconductor these are the two criteria to be taken care while selecting the electrodes also like mostly uh, we use molybdenum as a electrode here so these two uh, important criteria has to be taken care of now this is how this all uh, uh, solar cell like how energy is being harvested using the solar uh, solar cell wherein we are harvesting the energy from the solar spectrum of earth not earth or of the atmosphere so there were the four uh, technology like process first of all it was absorption then it was uh, generation then it was transport and finally it was collection of carriers so these four stages now to uh, uh, mathematically understand the working of a solar cell we need to uh, implement that uh, device in a form of uh, 
equivalent circuit so that we can understand how much energy is being liberated how much is being dissipated and all so a normal pn junction uh, not uh, solar cell can be uh, can be seen as a uh, this current source and uh, along with this current source we are showing some uh, two resistances also that is ish and ir uh, sorry rsh and rs uh, so they are basically the losses that are predominantly present in a solar cell which need not to be because uh, we need to get more and more efficiency but definitely there used to be so those can be uh, in like uh, can be characterized in a circuit form in the in these two resistances uh, a normal current that uh, will flow through a solar cell that is i so that current uh, is uh, uh, given as i is equals to il minus i not e to the power qv by nkt minus 1 minus of v plus irs upon rsh so basically uh, this equation is uh, nothing different than the normal pn junction diode current uh, current equation wherein this il is nothing but the light generated current and this i not is uh, like uh, um, this uh, a small current that is present uh, but we can say that's a dark current that is always present over there and uh, photogenic uh, it's a reverse saturation current of the diode and eta is the identity factor and this r s and rs are the series and short resistance respectively and finally this v is that v is nothing but the voltage generated across the uh, final terminal which we will use as a pa output power so to investigate the solar cell like how good it is in being harnessing the energy uh, depends on the four basic parameters uh, which is nothing but short circuit current isc uh, sorry uh, there's a mistake in uh, these two abbreviations uh, my apologies for it uh, this short circuit current has to be isc and this open circuit voltage has to be voc uh, my heartful uh, sorry for this and the, uh, then the third one is the fill factor and then efficiency so these four parameters basically are used to investigate that how much good my uh, device basically that solar cell device is good in harnessing the solar energy uh, in harnessing the solar energy so uh, we can see here now this is the iv characteristic graph of a solar cell so uh, since uh, my solar cell is uh, a device that generates power so as per the law of generation and all uh, this uh, product has to be negative for that uh, for getting this device to be power generating so my uh, we can also see here yeah uh, so this black color uh, if you can see this black color graph uh, this is nothing but uh, uh, it very much resemble a normal pn junction diode so if i can see um, that uh, if uh, if my uh, pn junction or any solar cell is not given any photon uh, presence so uh, because of the movement of some minority carriers present in pn junction there will be some shot of current that will be present that current we can uh, uh, we can say to be a dark current why it is dark because at this point of time my solar cell is not being uh, given by any sort of photon uh, any form of energy so that's why this current is called as dark current but as soon as uh, that my solar cell is being uh, propagated uh, through uh, by a solar cell uh, sorry a solar radiation then in that case uh, some more energy will be generated and then finally we will be able to collect some uh, more current and voltage at the end of the uh, like at our output so that is called as uh, this red color graph will comes in wherein it is shown that it's illuminated means when we uh, allow this uh, solar solar energy that is the photons to be present to be uh, bombarded on my solar cell device uh, I, just, yeah so these four parameters need to be uh, understood very clearly uh, so for that uh, the very, a very basic uh, terminology for this voc is that the open circuit voltage of a solar cell 
is the maximum voltage that can be that we can achieve across it when the current through it is zero means like uh, when there is an open circuit across the two terminals the two terminals basically are the two output terminals wherein we will be uh, connecting our output device or any kind of storage device to co collect that uh, energy uh, so that uh, open circuit voltage uh, is voc uh, which can also be uh, uh, given in the form of Then, uh, then comes this fill factor, FF. Uh, fill factor is nothing uh, but uh, both at open circuit and short circuit condition, the power extracted from the solar cell is zero. So fill factor can be defined as the ratio between the maximum power from the solar cell to the product of open circuit voltage and short circuit current. So fill factor is basically the ratio of the maximum voltage, a product of maximum voltage and current that can be extracted uh, from a solar cell divided by the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current. Uh, this Vm and Im I can show. Yeah, this one is this. This Vm is basically this that uh, maximum voltage that can be extracted uh, and then this maximum current uh, that can be extracted that has to be equal to ISC and the VOC but uh, will not be equal to because of the losses and all. This power conversion efficiency, uh, this eta is nothing but P max by P in. Uh, so the power conversion efficiency is the most common parameter that can be used to compare one solar cell to the other and can be calculated as a ratio between the maximum power that can be extracted from a solar cell to the input power. Okay, so maximum power that uh, P max can be shown uh, given as uh, VOC IOC times the fill factor. This P in is the input power and it is of interest. Like uh, what is the input power to a solar cell? So normally uh, we can, uh, we used to take it to be 1000 uh, watt, uh, 1000 watt, uh, for a normal uh, terrestrial solar cell. And finally, the fourth terminal that is the short circuit current. The short circuit current depends on the generation and collection of photo generated carriers and it can be given as uh, ISC is equals to QAG times uh, LN plus LP. These LN and LP are the diffusion lengths of electron and hole uh, multiplied by the generation factor that's uh, generation G. And uh, then finally, uh, this is a uh, uh, final constant, which is nothing but the area through which my current is, uh, like my device is illuminated and Q is the, uh, and, uh, and this Q is nothing but the charge. So these four parameters, like uh, this, the short circuit current, VOC, fill factor and efficiency are the parameters that are uh, characteristic parameters of a solar cell, which is used to emphasize on like how good my uh, solar cell is in harnessing the energy. Now, uh, as per my topic, uh, my topic was like uh, the solar cell, uh, like uh, energy harvesting through thin film based solar cell technologies. So what is this thin film solar cell based technology? I have told in like the third, third generation solar cell wherein the width of my absorber layer was very thin. Uh, it used to be uh, in very less of microns and uh, like in nanometers. So uh, this thin film solar cells are a promising approach for terrestrial and space photovoltaics and offer a wide variety of choices in terms of device design and fabrication. Uh, uh, because, uh, because of the presence of the thin films, uh, the efficiency is also very good and uh, cost of production goes very less and uh, finally uh, the uh, like the uh, if i if we have to use any solar cell for uh, ter non terrestrial like the space photovoltaics then the uh, there has to be some uh, constraint of the like the weight of and the dimensions and all so 
so in that case uh, this thin film solar uh, technology plays a vital role uh, a variety of substrate uh, substrate is nothing but uh, basically the base at which we fabricate our solar cell to harness the energy so this uh, substrate uh, can be uh, any of this like it can be a rigid material or can be a metal or insulator that doesn't make sense but uh, uh, yeah but the like uh, it can be any of them so this gives us like variety of substrates that can be used for deposition and uh, this deposition techniques like this uh, physical vapor deposition then chemical vapor dep uh, deposition and the plasma based technology and the hybrid and all it is very well uh, written that research and development in new exotic and simple materials and devices and innovative but simple manufacturing processes need to be pursued in a focused manner so that we can get uh, some like tfscs that can have a very good commercial place under the sun uh, yeah uh, this is uh, like uh, every year this nrel that's a national renewable energy laboratory uh, basically it's a uh, energy in this lab is uh, the in the energy department of us so they used to uh, show like how good my efficiency chart is moving so we can see it's a very recent like in 2020 uh, how it is going on uh, it's i think in, uh, in the month of october or uh, september so uh, like uh, this is the efficiency chart so we can see here at the top like uh, these are the technologies uh, that are used in solar cell and uh, how this technology has uh, harnessed its energy improvement in uh, year from 1975 to 2020 it has been shown here so um, you can see here in this thin film technology uh, that, uh, uh, that that was uh, basically concentrated of the cigs and then cadmium telluride and this uh, czts that is uh, he, uh, written here czts and se and uh, all those uh, um, like perovskite, quantum dot, inorganic and all. So we can see from here uh, that uh, out of all these uh, technology, if I see this emerging photovoltaic, why they have given it to the name of emerging photovoltaic? Because we can see the, like, uh, if you can see this graph, uh, they're uh, like in, in between 2000 and all, like in the past 20 years only, they have achieved a lot of improvement in their efficiency. And this, uh, and among all these emerging photovoltaics, the best one is, and in terms of efficiency, like uh, in terms of its efficiency improvement, we can see here yeah, this, uh, what we call is a perovskite uh, solar cell. So perovskite, uh, we can see here, like uh, it's a tandem with perovskite and CIGS. So we can see here that it has a very good slope, which shows that in very, like you can see it's just in 10 years, it has improved to an efficiency level of more than 16%, starting from a very low efficiency of 3%, which is a very boon in terms of efficiency enhancement. And definitely this research is being going on to achieve uh, this improvement uh, to uh, at least to energy of uh, around 30 to 32% also. If we talk about like this uh, perovskite silicon tandem, that's these triangles. So these have also shown a very good improvement in, in terms of energy improvement. Uh, the best one, uh, like here, if you can see, this is 47.1% theoretically. So this is for this uh, thin film crystal based, yeah, you can see here. Uh, of course, uh, silicon based solar cells only, but uh, these thin film crystals and they have improved a lot here also. And uh, this ga gallium arsenide based uh, single crystals, this uh, triangular, uh, this, uh, it's a purple color. We can see here, they have also shown very good improvement. And then if we can see that the highest of these are not. not uh, like this uh, square shaped in between the dots, they are basically for this four junction or more concentrated. So basically nowadays uh, uh, we are not only emphasizing on getting some technologies that can provide efficiency with single junction, but also they have moved on to tandem also. Tandem means when we are using more than one junction for solar cell uh, applications, uh, like uh, not solar cell application, for solar cell 
device generation. So, uh, what are the various good properties of a thin film based solar cell that has uh, uh, caused so much of uh, research in this area? These microstructures of films of most materials can be varied from one extreme of amorphous nanocrystallinity to highly oriented and or epitaxial growth depending on the technique. So we can see that uh, at one end it can be either amorphous or nanocrystalline of a very normal thing and at the other end it can be uh, very highly oriented. So uh, this flexibility of uh, is present in this thin film technology that is uh, causing a lot of ex uh, exploration in this area. Also. Uh, like we had a wide choice of shape, size, and areas, and substrates are available. Like uh, we can uh, change on to the availability of substrate depending on how good they are in uh, helping in uh, the fabrication of device, so that we can achieve more and more efficiency. Also, uh, because of the relaxed solubility and relaxed phase diagram, uh, this uh, more important thing is this: this doping and alloying with compatible and sometimes also non-compatible materials can be obtained. Like uh, this we call as that uh, material engineering wherein uh, we used to uh, dope some other materials in this absorber material so as to get some uh, more good uh, elements, sort elements, some more good elemental elements that can be present in our absorber material so as to improve the efficiency of the device. And also uh, a very uh, important aspect of this thin film is the surface and grain boundary passivation. Like uh, because of this non-passivated surface, we used to have lots of losses in a solar cell uh, because in uh, this uh, thick film solar cells. But when it comes to a thin film solar cells, like thin film technology, herein we can passivate the surface and grain boundaries, which are very much essential to get some uh, highly improvement in efficiency. Also, uh, these. Uh, single and tandem junctions are very much feasible with uh, thin film technology that was not been there in a thick film or that wafer based or we can say that uh, bulk material based solar cell technology this these uh, characteristics were not there present uh, here we can also uh, we can do some band gap engineering also like uh, in the very uh, earlier slides we have i have shown that depending on the band gap only we can choose the material so if we have some presence like some material present which is showing very good efficiency and if we have some material which do not have that much good efficiency uh, as compared to the other one then we can do some band gap engineering because all we know that by saying band gap engineering means we can just uh, dope some material in the device in that absorber material so that the if band gap gets varied and if it varied then uh, we can move on to uh, some uh, like very well established uh, band gap materials like uh, for the solar cell to be very active means to be very uh, good in providing efficiency it, uh, it's a uh, band gap has to be in between 1 to 1.5 or rather 1.3 to 1.5 so uh, with the presence of this band gap engineering which is very much possible with thin film technologies we can uh, do uh, this uh, band gap engineering and can get some good materials for absorber. Uh, in case of multi component materials, composition and hence band gap and other opto electronic properties can be graded in desired manner. Uh, like uh, when we were using uh, some uh, bulk materials, we were not able to uh, do some uh, changes, some grading in the other opto electronic properties, but, but in, when it comes to thin film, because with thin film, we somehow moving towards uh, very much uh, in, into uh, in the quantum region, like uh, wherein we can uh, just change the property of the material by changing certain things, which was not present in bulk material. So this thin film technology also provides some uh, ways to do that. And also surfaces and interfaces can be modified. That's a surface. I told that uh, we can passivate the surface, which is very much uh, important. And then also we can also uh, do some changes in the material or can change in the uh, band gap to get some good interfaces also because the interfaces the interfaces basically between the two materials present in solar cell which are being used for energy uh, harvesting and uh, like uh, integration of unit processes for manufacturing solar cell and integration of individual solar cells can be easily accomplished uh, 
and uh, and besides all these all thin film processes are in general eco friendly and are thus green processes why eco friendly because uh, the material present in this thin films are are very uh, uh, not that much uh, poisonous as compared to others uh, earlier i have told how a normal uh, pn junction based oral cell base uh, works it, uh, now here uh, this uh, diagram shows that how this uh, thin film solar cell works so uh, the basic working is very same like this buffer layer and this absorber material used to be that pn junction so there is nothing different between these two and the pn junction the only difference is these other layers so let me tell you what is this uh, this window layer is nothing uh, like uh, it's a uh, this layer basically consists of a material that ha that has a higher band gap why band higher band gap because uh, Uh, if if this window layer is not present, then my uh, solar cell radiation will fall at the buffer layer and the absorber that are basically the pn junctions. So it will scatter, uh, or rather, not uh, sometimes scatter, sometimes also reflect back my solar radiation. So not much of the solar radiation will come in. So this window layer is nothing, but it will allow maximum. Uh, solar spectrum like maximum of photons to enter the device because of its uh, high band gap because high, if it is high band gap it will absorb more number of photons with higher energy and then it will allow those uh, energy uh, those photons to pass on so this window layer has this pro uh, this uh, property this work sorry and uh, other than that this absorber layer i have already talked about this buffer layer is basically that uh, n type material because normally this absorber material has uh, absorber layer used to be a p type material so this pn junction is created by this two and then window layer i have told that how it works and find the two contacts and all so this working is very similar to a normal pn junction diode sorry normal pn junction diode based solar cell yeah this graph uh, it shows a pattern like uh, how this cost comparison can be done in between uh, thin film and non thin film based solar cell so although this data is only up to 2004 or 6 but it shows a trend that uh, uh, in very early 90s uh, this thin film technology was uh, basically uh, manufacturing cost was high and uh, the manufacturing cost of this non thin based technologies like this uh, thick film uh, basically the uh, bulk based technology it was very low but uh, we can see uh, the decrement in the manufacturing cost uh, this graph uh, we can just see that this decrement in uh, cost of production is very good as compared to like the percentage uh, change in the cost of production in uh, thin film based technology is tremendous as compared uh, to non non thin film based modules so this is uh, what uh, has made the researchers to work more and more in this uh, thin film technology so as to get much and much and good of efficiency because this cost of production is very less in uh, when it is dealing with a non uh, sorry when it is dealing with thin film technology as compared to uh this non thin film technology also this manufacturing uh, capacity uh this is uh, more or less uh, same for these two technologies but uh, if we talk about uh, this uh, cost of uh, manufacturing then it is less so this is all about this thin film technology how, uh, how thin film technology is useful how it is uh, Uh, harnessing the uh, solar cell, sorry, that uh, solar energy. Uh, so uh, my research area is basically based on this thin film technology, and uh, uh, as I have told earlier, that uh, that uh, CZTS, that is copper zinc tin sulfide, is a material, is an absorber material, uh, which is used as an absorber layer in a solar cell based on thin film technology. and uh, the efficiency so far it's just 12.6% but uh, what are the good qualities that we do have for this cjts is that um, the presence of this copper zinc and tin and sulfide we all see these all four are the earth abundant materials and none of them is hazardous like uh, none of them is uh, health hazard to any uh, uh, to any 
as compared to the previous thenfilm technology that it was cigs wherein this indium was an hazardous then uh, cadmium telluride and then cadmium was an hazardous element also uh, in cigs this indium is also very earth rare material so although the efficiency has uh, gone up to 22% but the commercialization of those solar cells has not been so much uh, uh, productive uh, because of these two very uh, basic hurdles so these two hurdles uh, doesn't goes with the cgts material so that's why this uh, this material is being uh, this material is being very much uh, used uh, nowadays uh, not used uh, means uh, being researched over so as to get the commercialization of the cgts if it goes up to 20% of uh, efficiency uh, it's a very uh, and my research work is basically uh, in the uh, absorber layer material which we which we used to have in the solar cell devices uh, for harnessing the energy so um, uh, if i'm talking if i'm saying that i'm working in a material science uh, domain of solar cell harnessing then uh, there used to be this crystallographic data wherein uh, like uh, cgts material is earth abundant and it occurs in two different uh, form like it can be either in the presence of castorite and it can be either astenite so uh, these castorite and astenite are two phases and they are segregated depending on the presence of atoms at various site positions so yeah so crystallographically we can see uh my this uh, cgts material is uh, as having uh, this uh, tetragonal structure and uh, if you can see here uh, this blue color balls are nothing but the copper atoms then this green color are the zinc atoms and the gray are the uh, tin and the finally this yellowish are the sulfur so my uh, this is on one basic unit cell of a uh, cgts absorber layer which we can see here and these two shows the two different uh, phases of uh, cgts that are basically castorite and stenite uh, why we have used uh, like why we are using cgts uh, what are the basic uh, very good uh, uh, properties of cgts are it's like it's a absorption coefficient is very high like uh, if i need to harness uh, the solar spectrum if i need to harness the solar energy in, uh, by using solar cell based on cgts absorber layer uh, the absorbent copper capacity which is uh, rated as uh, absorption coefficient it has to be very high so normally uh, uh, it is more than 10 to the power 4 per centimeter so which is very high and uh, also uh, i have told that uh, the band gap of a material has to be in between 1.3 to 1.6 so as to get a maximum energy conversion and for a typical cgts material uh, this efficiency sorry this band gap is uh, ranging between 1.4 to 1 1.6 uh more or less it used to be in between 1.45 to 1.55 uh it has a very high dielectric constant which is a very dominant uh, characteristic of a material to be used as a absorber material uh, uh, not only this band gap of 1.4 to 1.6 but it can it has a band gap tunability options also like uh, saying band gap tunability i mean that uh, we can tune this band gap and uh, uh, we have already i have already discussed that if my material has a uh, possibilities of changing its uh, band gap then we can uh, get more and more uh, photons to enter and then finally efficiency can be increased uh, this atmospheric stability is very good because none of this material these elements of cgts are uh, at, uh, atmospheric uh, reactive elements none of them and finally this non toxic uh, as i have already told that uh, the uh, contributory elements are non toxic and all all of them are earth abundant so uh, there are some challenges in cgts layer which uh, researchers are working uh, on so as to get uh, this hurdle of 12.6 efficiency uh, to improve so that we can harness more and more of solar spectrum by using cgts based solar cell so 
there are like these four very basic this anti side defects uh, the high open circuit voltage deficit the anti side defect is uh, the defect uh, depend uh, in a solar cell device uh, if i don't have uh, any reflection if i don't have any recombination in the absorption layer then my energy conversion of solar uh, solar energy to an electrical energy will always be very high but in the czts material there used to be some anti side things like at the um, element base at like in the crystal uh, form uh, there used to be some mismatch between the two elements and that causes an anti side defects which is a basic hurdle in not improving efficiency more than 12.6 like uh, research is going on to how to uh, tackle with this anti side defects then uh, there used to be some interface defects means uh, like uh, in the thin film solar cell uh, that device i have shown there used to be one buffer layer so the, uh, this buffer layer and the czts layer has some interface issues means uh, there used to be some uh, mismatch between the lattice constant of the two materials like normally we use cadmium sulfide as an uh, buffer layer in a uh, solar uh, solar cell based on czts so that interface uh, defects are also a basic hurdle in improvement of this uh, efficiency and uh, also this band mismatch with the buffer layer means uh, the band gap of the buffer layer if is equal to the band gap of uh, absorber layer then there will not be any losses of electron and hole so this is also an a factor there and finally this high open circuit voltage deficit which is an uh, more or less an implication uh, because of this band mismatch uh so how to solve these four like uh, the, how the researchers are solving these four issues like uh, we can change the preparation technology like the fabrication process of my solar cell device uh, can be uh, altered with the preparation technology like how uh, and then uh, compositional engineering then finally the optimization of the device structure like when we are using our solar cell uh, for non terrestrial applications uh, even if it's, it's a terrestrial application uh, my device structure if can optimize to a very minimal dimension then only it will be more and more fruitful to be used for those applications so uh, that itself uh, involves like uh, changing the device uh, like not changing but uh, uh, optimizing the width of the materials used and uh, also by changing the type of material used and all and finally there is one more possibility of band gap engineering that like uh, doing some composition change and if we can change the band gap of the material having the same property of the parent material but allowing more and more photons to enter that will uh, finally end up in giving the good efficiency sorry so uh, my research work is basically uh, divided into two part uh, one part i am working in like uh, the absorber material how to improve the material and at the same time also with the available material how we can improve the efficiency by changing the device optimization like uh, if i go back to this so uh, this preparation technology which goes into material material science engineering like how can we change my preparation technology to get some substitutions to copper and zinc in czts and the other one is the optimization of device structure so so far uh, one of my publication has like this Uh, wherein i have tried like uh, the czts used to be present and this buffer layer uh, has to be there and uh, these two are basically the uh, nothing but both of them collectively is a buffer layer but uh, we here we uh, we have used this intrinsic type of zinc oxide and then aluminium doped zinc oxide these two different uh, are just for having that band gap grading so as to get maximum amount of uh, Uh, absorption uh, sorry maximum amount of uh, photons to enter so uh, what we did in uh, this work uh, we have just uh, tried uh, working with Z, uh, zinc selenide which earlier used to be cadmium sulfide as a buffer layer and uh, then uh, we have changed uh, this uh, absorber layer with the stacking of czts and czts okay let me uh, czts is nothing but uh, copper zinc zinc selenide so uh, the properties uh, that czts uh, shows off uh, it's very similar to czts wherein we are, uh, we are just uh, doping uh, sulfur uh, sorry doping silica uh, sorry selenide in place of sulfur so this czts and czts are the two materials which are very similar in all the properties and are used uh, uh, like interchangeably 
but the best efficiency that the 12.6 percent efficiency I was talking earlier uh, is been obtained by this CJTSC material. Uh, this IV characteristic uh, in my like uh, basic of uh, solar cell, I, have, I was showing it was in the third quadrant and INV. It's just a mirror image of that, just for uh, sake of understanding, nothing more than that. So uh, this is the structure. So uh, these uh, this three uh, IV characteristics are basically for like early uh, for the first time uh, I have just taken CZTS as an absorber material. Then I replace CZTS uh, with CZTSE. And uh, we have obtained uh, this efficiency. And finally, we tried to stack these two CZTS and CZTSC uh, back to back to each other so that we can uh, just uh, incorporate the good properties of both CZTS and CZTSC at the same time. And then harnessing like energy harvesting using this device, uh, like the, using the simulation only. Uh, for this, uh, we have used this uh, AM 1.5G. AM 1.5 is like. Uh, uh, this uh, air mass 1.5 g uh, for normal like uh, terrestrial applications we used uh, this uh, uh, solar radiation and uh, and this blue one is for, for uh, stab is the iv characteristic for the stacking of the cztf and cztsc and we can see that it has shown a uh, better efficient, uh, better uh, IV characteristic, which eventually we can show in the table here. Yeah, we can see that uh, this stacking has shown uh, a very good efficiency, like this uh, asterisk mark uh, is mine work here. So this efficiency, uh, yeah, 12.21.17 percent, and this uh, fill factor. Fill factor is basically. Uh, the ratio that I will how much power that can be extracted and depending on the input power. So this was uh, one of my work. And uh, in, in, in field of this compositional engineering, um, as I have told that uh, we are we have we are trying to get uh, this uh, anti side defects to be uh, removed there and also uh, this uh, interface uh, defects should also be removed. So in that case, I have tried like uh, Recently, we have published one uh, paper in which we have tried uh, uh, changing this copper, like uh, we have um, uh, replaced copper with uh, Ag, that is a silver, and uh, zinc with uh, magnesium, Mg. And uh, then we have done, uh, calculated the properties of this new material. Uh, this new material was that is Ag2, Mg, SnS4. Uh, this is uh, uh, this can be used as an absorber material uh, in CZTS based solar cell. Means this material, uh, when we doped uh, uh, copper with Ag and uh, zinc with Mg, then we found that this property, uh, this material has very similar property to CZTS. So it can be used in place of CZTS. Then why we are using this? Like if we have CZTS already. So the uh, very good thing was that the anti-side defect has been uh, reduced in this material. This material has all the basic properties of CZDS like uh, I can show here that the band gap here for this material is 1.64 and it is very uh, uh, good for getting a uh, uh, material to be used as an absorber material because uh, for normal 1.3 to 1.6 or 6.7, uh, 6, 1.7 we can use that material for an absorber layer. So with this replacement, we found that uh, it, it lies very good in 1.64 and 1.23, uh, these two for sulfur, castorite, and like uh, I have told that this material exists in two forms, so castorite and stenite. And uh, this is uh, like uh, same stenite and stenite for sulfur and selenide. So we found that the band gap is far more good, like we can see here, it's 1.418, which is very good to be used as a solar cell material. So this material can be uh, used as a supplement to that well-established CZTS material. Also, uh, there are some uh, other graphs like the optical properties since we are dealing with the uh, uh, material to be used as a solar cell material for uh, getting this energy conversion. So we are much into its optical properties. So this uh, dielectric constant of the CZTS material uh, is very similar and has a value which is very much comparable to the CZTS, uh, already established CZTS material. These are the real and imaginary part. Also the absorption coefficient, 
uh, that have shown that uh, this uh, CZ tier was having uh, more than 10 raised to the power 4. But here, uh, with this material, it used to be more than, uh, you can see here, that the highest of this absorption coefficient goes around 1, 170 uh, into 10 raised to the power 4, which can we can see that 1.7 uh, raised to the power 5. So also this uh, uh, absorption coefficient got improved when we replaced uh, copper with uh, Ag and uh, zinc with Mg. So uh, this, uh, this was our publication that we published here in Solar Energy Journal and uh, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Abhishek, for a <coughs> quality research in the area of solar energy harvesting now uh, there is no such query from the participant side so we should say bye bye to Ashutosh Shrivastu bye Ashutosh good night to and finally this is the time to say bye bye to all the registered participants See you tomorrow all for first for the remaining lecture followed by validate session and in between there will be an one MCQ test. So you, you should be mentally prepared for that one. Okay bye. Good night. See you tomorrow. Thank you.